With Bukitima now in Japanese hands, General Yamashita knew he was on the verge of victory. But with increasing difficulty in getting supplies and ammunition to his frontline troops, he could not immediately press home his advantage. Despite holding the upper hand, Yamashita also recognized the need to bring hostilities to a swift conclusion. As even with control of the high ground and total air superiority, a street-to-street -street battle against a numerically superior force, however disorganized, was the last thing that he wanted. But that was what he now faced. So he decided to offer his opposite number the chance to surrender. With crucial supply dumps now in Japanese hands and no chance of winning them back, Percival knew that defeat was near. With less than two weeks of military supplies remaining, water running short and the enemy probing at his final defensive perimeter, he also had to consider the possibility of a humanitarian disaster. Yet he had been ordered to keep the invaders engaged for as long as possible by his superiors who had themselves been ordered to fight on for the British Empire's honour by Churchill himself. So on the afternoon of the 13th, Percival called a meeting here at his HQ in Fort Canning to canvass the opinion of his commanders. With his orders in mind, Percival pushed to organise a counterattack. Yet the overwhelming consensus among his subordinates was that not only was a counterattack out of the question, carrying on would only prolong the inevitable and could make things worse in the event of a fighting defeat. Therefore, surrender was the only option. Percival eventually decided to continue the battle, but at the same time relay the will of the others to his superiors. Meanwhile, back on the battlefield, with the defenders now occupying a tight perimeter, there were fewer gaps for the Japanese to penetrate. And with no more room left to retreat, the Allied troops were now fighting for their very survival. These factors, coupled with the need to reserve ammunition, meant that Japanese progress over the next few days slowed or even ground to a halt in some areas, with fierce exchanges taking place on several fronts. Here in modern-day Bishan, the Imperial Guards and troops from the 2nd Cambridgeshire Regiment fought it out on Hill 90, in and among what were then the grave-studded hills of Bigzanting. The defenders putting up stiff resistance and slowing the enemy's progress to a crawl. Meanwhile, here at Adam Park, the building-to-building -building fighting that Yamashita had hoped to avoid became a reality, as British troops held out heroically for around two days against the 5th Division's 41st Regiment. The battles taking place in and around the estate's black and white houses. Other elements of Japan's 5th Division went head-to-head -head with Allied defenders at Bukit Brown Cemetery, while here along Mount Pleasant Road, the colonial era houses and their gardens were the site of some fierce battles in the last couple of days before surrender. As the Japanese continued to probe Percival's final perimeter, another battlefront opened up on Friday the 13th, as the 18th Division moved to the south and the ridges above the village of Pasir Panjang. Here they encountered fierce resistance from the defending troops. The hostilities began early that morning as Japanese planes and artillery bombarded the troops of the 1st Malays who were holding the high ground over here at what was then known as Reformatory Road. Forced to retreat by the intense bombardment, they held the invaders at bay with the support of the 6-inch guns here at Labrador Battery. But when the guns fell silent after being abandoned in the afternoon, the Malay regiment's position became untenable and they were forced to retreat overnight to the Alexandra Road area, with C Company taking up positions on Opium Hill, or Bukit Chandu as it is known in Malay. Contrary to popular belief, the massive guns of the island's coastal fortresses were able to play a role during the defence of Singapore. Although not designed to defend the island from an overland attack from the north, several of the batteries, including the monster guns here at the Johor Battery in Changi, were able to traverse and fire northwards at the advancing Japanese. 
Their effect, however, was limited due to a shortage of the high explosive rounds that would have done serious damage to the invaders. The next day, Japanese troops disguised as Indians attempted to take the hill here. But quick thinking by Lieutenant Adnan Saidi, who opened fire on them after becoming suspicious of their formation, foiled the plot. A fierce battle ensued, with both sides suffering heavy casualties during intense hand-to-hand -hand combat. But cut off from any support, the Malay soldiers were eventually overwhelmed, while Adnan was captured and subsequently tortured to death. A handful of troops did manage to escape, although several perished while jumping over drains filled with burning oil that had leaked from the nearby Normanton depot. Only four men managed to make it back to HQ to report that their battalion had been wiped out. Meanwhile, the heavy toll inflicted on the Japanese in the battle for the southern ridges was to have serious repercussions at the nearby Alexandra Military Hospital. Early in the afternoon of the 14th, hospital staff had noticed Japanese troops approaching the grounds from the direction of Ayaraja Road. As the invaders closed in, a member of staff waved a red flag from an upper window, only to be shot at. Then, when another member of staff went to reception to meet them in surrender, he was bayoneted to death, despite clearly displaying a white flag. Japanese troops then went on a rampage through the hospital's main block, bayoneting doctors, orderlies and other medical staff. Even patients lying on operating tables were not spared. Around 80 staff were killed in total. A number of people managed to survive the massacre by pretending to be dead. Following the initial attack, around 200 or so staff and patients were rounded up, tied together and then frog-marched from the football field here to an outhouse near the sisters' quarters around 200 yards away. There, they were crammed inside three small rooms, thought to be former servants' quarters, and left overnight without ventilation or food and water. The next day, their captors began leading the men out two by two to execute them. The only survivors of the massacre were a handful of men who managed to escape through a hail of machine gun fire after the corner of their building was destroyed by friendly fire. According to the War Crimes Tribunal in 1946, the perpetrators were never brought to justice. The 14th also saw Percival receive some ominous news, as the city's chief engineer warned that the island's entire water network could collapse at any moment. This news prompted Governor Shenton Thomas to join the calls for surrender. And although Percival was keen to fight on, circumstances were dictating that the time to stop was now closer than ever.